I'm not so far into Remedies Control to have a complete grasp on all of its finer meaning, but I do understand one thing that needs little to no explanation. The usage of ray traced effects in Control is sublime, and perhaps this game is THE ray tracing killer app. It has now been more than a year since we have entered the real-time triangle ray tracing era with the launch of NVIDIA's RTX GPUs, and Control is a definitive step forward. Excluding fully path-traced Quake 2 RTX or the upcoming Minecraft RTX, this game represents the most total implementation of ray tracing we have seen in a game targeting AAA graphical quality. With its detailed character models, intense effects works, and ultra-modern graphical features, the game is fantastic looking. Even without ray tracing here, we are looking at a top-tier graphical presentation, and ray tracing amps up so many scenes and views to a next level. It's really a next-generation look. What do I mean? Well, let's look at a singular game scene to explain it all. Here is a standard scene in Control, albeit with some exceptions. Here the game is rendering without ray tracing. It is also rendering without screen space ambient occlusion, without screen space reflections, and without cone traced sign distance field reflections. It still has lighting coming from the game lights in the scene, done through normal rasterized analytical lighting, and Remedy's version of its more static bounce lighting, the game's global illumination. If you ignore things like physically based shading, or how high poly and rounded a lot of the objects in the scene are, you basically actually have a game scene from a very high-end console game from the Xbox 360 or PS3 era, real-time lighting and shadowing for select lights, and a static rough bounce of global illumination lighting. Then Crisis hits in 2007 and BAM! Real-time screen space ambient occlusion is now possible. By leveraging the game's knowledge of how objects are close to each other in 2.5 dimensions, additive shadowing is inserted into that previous image. Where shadows beforehand had more or less a single tone, now they have definition. It is not simulating how light bounces around, but it is emulating what happens to those spaces where bounced light cannot reach. The image is now looking a bit more akin to real life where objects in shadow do not look like they're floating. Come 2011 with Crisis 2 and many other games following it, we now have screen space reflections. Once again, by leveraging that information found in screen space, that 2.5D image, color can be reprojected as a reflection by tracing rays in that screen space. Remedy's control actually has a pretty great SSR that suitably darkens, stretches to a degree, and can affect different surfaces of varying smoothness. So you can see sharp reflections in a marble surface while seeing more glossy reflections in a duller metal. These reflections can only represent information present on the screen, so everything out of the screen edges or in that space between objects on different depth planes cannot be represented. So there's information missing here and that reflection is incomplete. In other games when screen space reflections fail, the surface reflection then falls back to a cube map usually, which is a six-sided low resolution capture of the game world at some point an area in the game world. That cube map will definitely not line up with the perspective of the viewer from every angle, and it's probably not even dynamic, so it can often look really wrong. Forfeiting these types of reflections, Remedy in Control has gone one step further and has introduced actually cone trace sign distance field reflections for the game world. A sign distance field can be thought of as a very coarse representation of the game world that is then traced into with a form of tracing that produces smooth, non-noisy images. The problem, of course, is that this result is a very low resolution, like a cube map. As Remedy has stated, each facet of that sign distance field reflection is larger than many of the game objects. Like here, how you can see the cone tracing produces an image with much thicker features than they actually are, which the SSR can actually show. Here, the pillar in the cone trace reflection is much bigger than it actually should be. These then form the fallback for screen space reflection in those areas where SSR fails. With these effects added up, Remedy's control is a genuine state-of-the-art game, and this is how graphics generally look in console versions of the game. This is right at the tip of modern rendering as it is done on consoles and on PCs until recently. So we have gone from pre-2007 graphics to 2019 graphics as you can find them on consoles in this one scene. That's quite the advancement. 
Now let's start our advance into the real-time ray tracing era. First, with the introduction of diffuse global illumination. This ray traced accelerated effect utilizes Remedy's pre-existing voxel-like global illumination and shoots out rays to make its results more accurate and adhere to the world geometry better. The standard GI in this game is actually pretty great, but it can misalign with objects, have obvious resolution stepping, and leak through thin objects. This helps against that. It also does this for dynamic objects as well, and forming a natural ambient occlusion effect, so to speak, so it can effectively replace the game's screen space ambient occlusion. Then on top of this, a local colored light is bounced around in another step afterward, making dynamic and static objects have another contribution to the game's indirect lighting. This step is crucial to go beyond the game's standard lighting model. Now in many images or in many scenes, objects have an intense interdiffuse reflection, making all the objects seem related to each other instead of being more disparate. The whole image looks more cohesive as a result. Starkly colored dynamic objects that are brightly lit are now casting light onto neighboring objects or the floor. Returning to our unnerving room here, we can see how GI is adding indirect shadows that more accurately reflect the scene's geometry. But also, a subtle bounce of light from the brown on the chair itself, and a bit more red from that red floor. Since this scene actually has many metallic or glass objects, the diffuse lighting that it adds is a bit less obvious. Similarly less obvious in the scene are the inclusion of ray-traced contact shadows. Unlike Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which wholly replaces many shadow maps with ray traced versions, the option in control adds a sharp contact shadow in for all those details that are too small to be seen in the shadow map given its lower resolution. It essentially enhances the results from the shadow map, adding in tiny shadows for small objects. Likewise, since they are ray traced, it also makes objects connect more with the ground, eliminating that classic Peter Panning effect where the shadow map is misaligned with the real casting point of the shadow. This effect is comparatively subtle though in comparison to the GI and other effects done through ray tracing. In the phone scene here, we are seeing smaller shadows added onto the phone itself and onto the crevices of the chair. A much more transformative effect occurs when we add in fully ray-traced opaque reflections. Slotting in over the SSR and Contrace SDFs, this effect offers total reflections on any surface that is even slightly reflective. Like SSR, this changes the reflection's sharpness based upon distance, viewing angle, and the material's roughness. So you can see reflections of a differing sharpness depending upon the material and the way you're looking at it. But at the same time, it is also reflecting things not visible in the immediate view. This effect applies at any and every scale, and is very high quality. Decidedly of a higher quality than Battlefield 5 uses ray trace reflections, as this uses one ray for every screen pixel, whereas Battlefield 5's alter setting had a variable ray tracer for reflections, with a maximum of 40% of the screen's resolution casting a ray, so 4 out of 10. In the end, this means that the reflections are crisp and stable without looking low resolution. Depending upon the view, this can easily be the most transformative ray tracing effect out of the ones available. It does not make the surfaces in actuality shinier. Not at all. Rather, it makes them have the reflections that the other techniques fail to actually represent depending upon the material. Like this glazed wood texture on this wall here. Here without ray tracing at a perpendicular view, the material is extremely flat as SSR cannot capture off-screen information and the cone trace is of a very low frequency. With ray traced opaque reflections on, it takes on that sheen that you would expect of a polished glazed wood instead of looking overly diffused like a plain texture. This applies to every object in the game and does some incredible stuff like adding in reflection occlusion in areas where the other techniques fail. Like here behind this trash can, it should be darkened following real lighting physics, but the standard techniques cannot capture that small out of screen detail on a dynamic object. Ray traced opaque reflections fix that in a great way. 
Or here you can see the reflection of the main character in the various surfaces of this wall, like the rough metal of the shelter casing, the external components of the console, and in a distorted and rounded form on the tiny monitor in the way. All these reflections have a different level of sharpness, depending upon the material and the way you look at it. Without ray tracing, they basically fully disappear. Coming back to our phone scene, the phone is now self-reflecting itself, off-screen reflections from the room are brought on in on the table, and the giant area light above is showing on the metals and leathers of the chair. Even the carpet now is showing up in all of its red brilliance in the metals of this scene. Truly an awesome combination. The last bit that really pushes the visuals over the top are the transparency reflections. These add mirror reflections to any transparent glass in the scene. Here you can see how the entire environment is reflected back in perfect detail on a flat mirror-like plane of glass. The reflection on the glass shows more readily in those areas where the area behind the glass is darker. Like opaque reflections, this applies to even the tiniest of objects at unprecedented detail, like how you can see the main character here in this tiny glass bottle on the shelf. Or here in this scene where the rasterized view looks pretty good, but suitably gamey, and the glass looks like it is glowing even though it is being lit and shadowed properly in a rasterized way through the sunlight. The way the lighting wraps around the glass in the rasterized view reveals all the polygon edges on it in an obvious way as a side effect. If you add in RT effects plus the transparency reflections, that glass in the coffee maker now looks more situated in the world. It does not look like it's glowing, and oddly enough the lighting on it now makes its polygon edges less obvious in comparison. The detail goes beyond the pale when you realize that you can see your moving character model here in the reflection and even read the newspaper out of frame on the desk nearby. In the all too important phone room, we see the glass in the background now offering a mirror reflection of the room inside. Since the area beyond is pitch black, the reflections themselves show up in a stark manner. That's basically how lighting physics work. If you put the three main versions of the scene together that I have shown today, you have one using techniques most similar to over a decade ago, one using the highest end techniques of today, and one using techniques of the future. There's quite a jump in realism when going from left to right here. The last ray traced effect available is actually not one that our little glass room can showcase, and only can be found in the Fury of Combat. The ray trace debris option merely adds small stones and rubble into ray traced reflections that would otherwise not be there. It's a small effect, but nicely appreciated. When all these five effects combined, static scenes look cohesive on a level that makes them feel real, uncannily real, instead of a bunch of disparate game objects stuck together. And in motion, well, the real-time nature of ray tracing means that you can see all of that lighting and shadowing updating in real time in front of you as explosions crack off and debris fills the air. So it's incredibly impressive. But not everything is perfect, this is real-time ray tracing we're talking about here. The diffuse global illumination in the game is an incredible visual addition over the standard type, but its diffuse low ray count introduces noise and indirect shadows that is otherwise not there with it off necessarily. Likewise, even though the Diffuse GI effectively replaces SSAO in physical terms, the game allows you to curiously leave SSAO on with RTGI on. It's a curious allowance in the game options given how it's less physically accurate and incurs a performance penalty. And lastly, since GI is modifying the game's less accurate base GI, it can actually inherit some of that base GI's faults, like how it leaks through geometry at times. Along with those issues for the Ray Trace Diffuse GI, 
If there's very bright reflections on a very rough opaque surface, you can see similar noise occurring. But that is actually decidedly rare. The more obvious artifact that you would see would be ghosting in reflections, which can occur in reflections on extremely fast moving objects, possibly best seen here in the cars outside the window in the game staging area. These artifacts are actually ones that you can expect to see in modern generation games without ray tracing, as lower sample counts and temporal data are common in making many of the effects we use today work. But these artifacts are definitely also found in the realm of ray tracing on the GPU. To fix that, you would need a higher ray count or more samples to be shot for that effect, a perfect denoiser, which doesn't exist, or by increasing the output rendering resolution, which is coupled with that ray count. Higher resolution in a game with this many ray tracing effects? Well, this is where we get to talk about performance and settings prioritization. All of the PC footage shown so far in this video was done at an internal rendering resolution of 1080p, being reconstructed up to 4K via Deep Learn Super Sampling. DLSS. Did this look like standard 1080p in this video? Definitely not, but DLSS image quality here is something I'm leaving actually up to another video at this point, as there's so much to talk about here. The real point though is that an ASUS ROG Strix RTX 2080 Ti at that internal rendering resolution of 1080p and every setting put to the max will have a game primarily at 60 FPS in most scenes, but with some scenes without combat even pushing that down into the upper 50s. In large combats with the breeze and the effects work, that can go down even further. So if you max the game out at 1080p, it is not a guaranteed stable 60fps on the biggest GPU there is. But before I go into how to tweak these settings downward to get better performance, it's important to mention how Remedy's control currently under DX12 seems to have a hitching problem. I've experienced this before in other DirectX 12 games, and I think it may be as a result of shader compilation issues. Basically, a shader permutation occurs, and it has to compile in real time, causing a stutter. And this will happen rather often in your gameplay of control under DX12. Beyond GPU settings itself, this is actually the thing that gets in the way of the game's fluidity at the moment, and I really hope it can be fixed. There are many times in a firefight or just walking around when you can see a full-on stutter, and it can take a long amount of time as you can see here visually on screen. So this is definitely not a great thing, and I really hope Remedy can change this through patching or NVIDIA can help through a driver, but at the moment I've experienced firefights in a very stuttery manner. If you can't avoid these stutters, you should still at least try and get a higher frame rate, and that involves changing settings. Ultra settings with maxed out RT effects are not necessary to make this game look good with ray tracing on, let alone without ray tracing. Ultra effects never are necessary, and they are always seen as options for the future, and this game has many ultra effects options. First things first. Every frame counts if we want to maximize meaningful fidelity with and without ray tracing, even on an RTX 2080 Ti, which I'm using for the following performance numbers. If you are playing with ray tracing on or off, you will first want to reduce volumetric lighting to medium. It will have a minor change on volumetric resolution and breakup, but yield a 12% performance increase over high. With RT off, you will also want to, in general, reduce screen space reflections to medium. It will affect their noisiness in general and how crisp they look on rougher surfaces, but it will increase performance by 7% at medium over high. Likewise, if you are playing without RT on, you will want to turn down global reflections to medium. It has a very small visual hit, but at times a 1% or more increase in performance, which is worth it I think in the end. Agnostic to your choice to run ray tracing, the game offers MSAA, which is rather rare for a modern title and is surprisingly cheap. The game's TAA does a pretty good job on opaque edges, where MSAA helps are seemingly keeping those transparency edges like the grates here on the ground more stable, or your character hair looking more flush without breaking up. Still, I recommend leaving MSAA to off to save for more important visual aspects. But if you want to turn on MSAA to 2x, you will lose around 3% performance. With 4x, that increases to a 7% performance loss. Beyond these settings without RT on, which effects you choose to use for ray tracing depends on your priority. But having played the game a lot, 
Given the game's wealth of shiny surfaces, opaque reflections and transparency reflections on average are going to be one of the largest visual differences you will ever see, especially since the camera moves and SSR will be constantly breaking, and without transparency reflections the glass looks rather gamey in control. If you were to turn on just opaque reflections, that would net you around a 32% performance decrease. Transparency reflections to on around a 22% performance decrease. So they are the most visible effects at all times, but they're also the most demanding in performance. If you do manage to turn on opaque reflections, I also recommend turning off global reflections. As far as I know, opaque reflections completely replace them, and you may get a minor FPS bump by just slotting that down to off. A similar approach applies if you want to utilize ray trace global illumination, which effectively replaces SSAO. The game allows you to leave on SSAO though, so turning it off with RTGI on means a 2% performance increase. Although they have an incredibly nice effect on the image quality, I think RTGI and RT Shadows and RT Debris are decadent choices in comparison to the reflection options if you wish to try and preserve 60 FPS with a ray tracing GPU with reflections on. Turning on RTGI by itself yields around a 13% performance decrease. Turning on RT Shadows by itself will yield you a 7% or so performance decrease. So with this knowledge in hand, I think optimized performance without ray tracing looks like this, sacrificing some quality in reflections and volume metrics for frame rate. With ray tracing, I think it depends much on your personal preferences, but I will say any and every ray tracing GPU should at least attempt opaque reflections as a settings minimum and then start going up from there. But if that's not your performance priority, then utilize the cheaper shadow and GI settings to still get a nice visual win. So with all these numbers now in your head, you may be wondering how do these key settings stack up to the best console version in the Xbox One X? Well, it's actually a rather uninteresting story in the end, and is quite reflective of many other console games we've been seeing later in this generation. Nearly all of the answers can be found within the first two minutes of the game by doing side-by-sides. As the initial opening area shows, Xbox One X looks to be using no multi-sample anti-aliasing, as any form of MSAA causes the hair here on the main character to fully render. When the camera swings around to the lobby entrance, it's also easy to see that the Xbox One X's level of detail for objects is lower than the PC's lowest setting here. This can be seen on this flag here, where any setting between high and low do not deform the mesh here to this lower poly version as seen on Xbox One X. If you look at the floor, you might notice that the reflections look different in general. That is because Xbox One X looks to be using the medium global reflection setting. After flipping that on to medium, it's likewise easy to tell that Xbox One X is utilizing a setting closest to medium for SSR as the position of the reflections match for medium and high SSR does not darken the reflection as much, whereas medium does. The only setting I could not really determine was the volumetric lighting setting, which might be high or medium as I see it, as they both look very very similar and very very diffuse. But that's enough of the console versions. This is a PC video after all, and let's get to those PC performance numbers. Following my various versions of optimized settings, the RTX 2060 Super really does a number on the game here at 1080p. At optimized settings without ray tracing, the GPU would be a great contender for 1440p at 60fps actually. When looking at utilizing the RT effects, it would appear that the combined reflection setting is too much for the GPU to ensure 1080p 60, as this opening area of the game is decidedly lighter than the rest. So it would have to drop out transparency or opaque reflections to achieve that. RTGI plus shadows, on the other hand, has a much better showing above 60, with perhaps just necessitating dropping RT shadows in some scenes to maintain a frame rate. The RTX 2070 Super though is much more apt at utilizing those ray tracing features, managing really well above 60 FPS at 1080p with RTGI and shadows, and correspondingly well with the various ray traced reflections engaged. 
A GPU of this caliber could enable at least two effects at 1080p and maintain a healthy 60fps margin. Of course, it goes without saying that this GPU does very well in this game without any RT at all. So there you have it. Remedy's Control is a gorgeous game. With all the ray tracing settings maxed out, it is a legitimate look into the future of real-time rendering in games. As of right now though, not many GPUs will manage very well at hitting 60 FPS with multiple of the ray tracing effects turned on, even at 1080p for some GPUs. That's quite the butcher's bill, but as I see it, that's a great thing, as I love ultra settings that are meant for the future. If you do use more optimized settings with and without ray tracing, then its costs become more reasonable, and it is generally a well-running game for its visual output on PC. Though I hope they can manage to fix that presumed shader compilation stutter that I experienced under DirectX 12. But beyond control and before I forget, I would like to thank Lance McDonald, who aided me in setting up the free camera on the PC version that I used for a lot of those awesome ray tracing comparison shots in this video, so thanks Lance. And likewise, thank you, the viewer, for watching this video. If you did like it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, then please consider ringing that bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk to me about ray tracing and control, well, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.